Hello and welcome back to The Effect. Uh, so we've been talking about matching for a few videos, uh, and we've been talking about different ways of doing matching, different kinds of questions you need to ask yourself. One that we have not gone that far into is the kinds of assumptions that we need to make uh, for matching to be appropriate, or what are the things that we can check to see if things are going well. Uh, so there are three that I'm going to talk about in this video. I'm going to talk about conditional independence assumption, I'm going to talk about common support, and I'm going to talk about balance. So we're going to talk about all three of those things. Uh, let's start with a simple one, which is the conditional independence assumption, and get that one out of the way quickly. So what is this saying? So the thing we're doing with matching is we are picking a set of matching variables, and we are matching our treated and controlled groups on that set of variables. The reason we're doing this is to close back doors between treatment and outcome. Uh, that's what we want to do, right? We want to make sure that the differences between the treated group and the control group are driven by the effect of treatment, uh, as opposed to any sort of factor variables that are driving a relationship between the two. The conditional independence assumption is saying that we have basically done that, that we have closed all the back doors. Uh, if you want to take a matched, treated, and control group and compare them and say that the difference between them is the effect of treatment, uh, then you need to assume that you have matched on all the variables that you need to close all of the back doors. That the treatment is basically random, uh, conditional on the matching variables that you have selected. So this is basically just another way of saying that if we want to identify the effect of treatment on outcome, we need to close all the back doors. We've already sort of covered that, so we can sort of say that's what that's the name of it uh, in the matching context context, the conditional independence assumption, in other words, closing all the back doors, or in the regression context, getting rid of all the admitted variable bias. We got a lot of different words for the same idea. All right, let's move on to something that's a bit more specific to matching itself, which is common support. Uh, so what common support says is that we're trying to match a treated and a controlled group on the basis of some characteristics or perhaps some propensity score. We need to make sure that there are actually people to match to. You can imagine why this might be an important requirement. Uh, let's say, for example, that we are, that once again, back with our job training program example, one of the effect of a job training program. Uh, and let's say that this job training program really wants to target, uh, let's say, people who live in a particular neighborhood. So it goes to a particular neighborhood, let's say it is Capitol Hill in Seattle, where the college that I work is located. Uh, and so they really, really try hard to recruit all the people in Capitol Hill. So then we want to look at the effect of this job training program. Uh, and so we want to say, well, you know, maybe the neighborhood that you live in is on a back door, right? That could have different outcomes for different kinds of reasons based on your neighborhood. So we want to match people who are in the job training program against people who are not in the job training program, but in the but, uh, matching on their neighborhood. But if everybody in Capitol Hill got recruited, uh, and all the people who are in the control group who weren't recruited into the program are not in Capitol Hill, well, we simply can't match on neighborhood. There's nobody in Capitol Hill who wasn't treated to match to. And similarly, there's nobody who is treated not in Capitol Hill who might we want to match on the untreated uh, group. So we need to make sure that there are people to match to in both the treated and control groups, or else things will not function properly. So in order for matching to work properly, we need to make sure that there is what is called substantial overlap uh, in the distributions of the variables that we are matching on. Uh, if we want to match on a particular variable, uh, we need to make sure if we look at the distribution of that variable in the treated group and the distribution of that variable in the control group, that there is at least some ranges of that variable for which you see a lot of people in both treated and control. Otherwise, you can't really match on that variable very well. Let's take a look at an example of this. So let's look at a study uh, by Brookman. Uh, and what Brookman was looking at was he sent a bunch of fictionalized requests for help to legislators uh, from an email name that sounded like it belonged to a black person, Tyrone Washington, a fictional Tyrone Washington. Uh, and what he was curious about uh, was if you are a legislator and you receive an email from somebody who lives outside your district, uh, are you going to respond to them or not? Because there's not really an inherent in benefit to doing so, right? You're not, they're not going to vote for you. They can't. They don't live in your district. Uh, he was also interested in whether the rate of response to this black sounding name was going to be different based on whether you're a black legislator or a non-black legislator. So the treatment variable here is whether you are a black legislator or not. Now he clearly recognized that there is going to be a back door here, uh, that black legislators are more likely to be elected in, in areas where there are a lot of black people living. And so the number, the percentage of black people in your area is going to be a back door between whether your legislator is black or not, uh, and also maybe whether you respond to the email for some other kind of reason. So if we look at the distribution of the percentage of people black in the district between black legislators and non-black legislators, now we see that things are actually quite different. Uh, among non-black legislators, uh, a vast majority of them live in areas where there are not a lot of black people in the district. Uh, whereas in, uh, if you're a black legislator, it's very, very likely that you're in a district that is between 50 and 75% black. Uh, it's a very, very different distribution. 
And so if we want to compare the black legislators to the non-black legislators, uh, and we want to close the back door through how many black people live in the area, we need to look for an area of common support. Uh, so maybe that area between, uh, you know, a very the relatively low percentage of black people, maybe there's some common support there. If you look at the place where most of the black legislators are, the 50 to 75% black range, there's simply not enough non-black legislators to really say that we can compare the black and non-black legislators. There's a failure of common support in that area. Uh, now I'm talking about common support in the context of a particular matching variable, but if you're doing something like propensity score matching, you also want to make sure that there is common support for the propensity score. Uh, if you want to compare the treated to the non-treated groups, uh, and you want to adjust for the propensity of being treated, you need to make sure that there are some treated people who had some decent probability of not being treated. And you want to make sure that there are some untreated people who had a decent probability of being treated. Uh, and if we look at the propensity score distribution for the black and non-black legislators, uh, we see that they are very much disjointed. There's not a whole lot of legislators that we can say, yes, this legislator is black, um, but I can find a non-black legislator uh, who had a similar probability of being in this area based on their uh, propensity score. And we, if we, we don't have a lot of non-black legislators who we can say, yes, we can really compare to a black legislator who had a similar probability of being treated, right? There's not a whole lot of overlap there. So when we have this, what can we do about it? Well, uh, and a common thing that you might do is just simply try to trim or drop observations for which there is not common support. Uh, so for example, we might look at that graph on the left there uh, and say, okay, you know what? I see a lot of black legislators who are in areas with 50 to 75% black, but there's simply not enough non-black legislators to compare them to. I might have to drop all those black legislators simply because I don't have a good match to compare them against. In doing so, we might end up with a graph like this, where we drop everybody uh, with a particularly high propensity score because the only area where we can really compare people is among the low propensity score uh, re ranges. So here I'm doing what's called dropping areas of non-common support, where there's not enough control or not enough treatment observations in a given range of our matching variable, or in this case, propensity score. So we simply don't even try to match in those areas because there's nobody to match to. Uh, so there are some clear problems with doing this, right? We get a better match uh, for the observations that are in our sample, but we're also dropping a lot of observations, right? Uh, now, once we do this, once we drop those observations, we are dropping a lot of those black legislators. So if we're trying to compare black to non-black legislators, uh, we're dropping the most common kind of black legislators who are the ones who live in the 50 to 75 percent proportion black range. And so we fix a statistical problem that we don't have any controls to compare to, uh, but we do sort of introduce this idea that maybe our new estimate is not quite as representative of the actual distribution. So dropping areas of non-common support is common. Uh, in the case of propensity score matching, you might also commonly trim the propensity score, simply drop any observations with really low or really high propensity scores because it's unlikely that you'll have a match in the other range, right? It's unlikely that if you have a 90% chance of being treated, that you'll find a lot of control observations to, to compare to. Because uh, if they had a 90% chance of being treated, they're probably treated. Uh, similarly, if you have a 0.05% chance of being treated, uh, probably not a lot of treated observations to compare to, so we might drop that really low value as well. Uh, and so the solution to having bad common support is simply to drop observations without good common support, uh, which does fix the problem, but then also introduces a new one of, hey, how representative is your new estimate? Really. Another thing we needed to check when we're doing matching is balance. And I've talked about this one a little bit in previous videos, uh, but balance is basically you do your matching, you get your matched control and treatment or weighted matched samples, whatever you want to do, uh, and you check how well the matching seems to work, right? Your goal with matching is either to make sure that the matching variables that you have are similar, uh, either in their average or their distribution or whatever, uh, or that the propensity score is similar between the treated and controlled groups after your matching. So you can ask yourself, hey, did that actually occur. If I look at the average of the matching variables, are they the same in the treated and control group? If I look at the propensity score distribution, is that the same in the treated and control group? A common way to do this is what's something called a balance table, uh, where you simply look at the average of each of the control variables, or perhaps the propensity score, uh, in both the treated and control group, and you hope that they are quite similar. And if they're not, you might want to go back and redo some of your matching process uh, in the hopes that you can maybe get a better match. And that's totally legit, right? Going back and redoing your match to try to get a better match, that is you know, just making your match work better. Here's an example of a matching table from the Brookman study, uh, looking at uh, mean household income, the percentage of people black in the district, and whether the legislator is a Democrat, uh, both before matching and after matching. What you can see, let's look at the median household income, for example. Uh, before matching, median household income was quite different. Uh, household income was a lot higher uh, in the areas with white legislators than it was in the areas with black legislators. Uh, but after matching, it was able to find uh, sets of 
uh, control observation sets of areas with white legislators that had similar kinds of household incomes to the areas with black legislators. And so before matching, the difference was 3.33 to 4.435, but after matching, it was only 3.33 to 3.316, right? Much closer comparison. We actually match it on the mean perfectly for the legislator as a Democrat variable, right? Before, 97.8% uh, of the black legislators were Democrats, but only 50.1% of the non-black legislators were. Uh, but after matching, uh, it was exactly 97.8% for both of them, right? It ended up picking almost entirely Democratic uh, non-black legislators as treatment and control uh, observations for the black legislators. Now, to be clear, this balance table is comparing the means of the matching variables. That's not the only kind of way that you can check balance. Uh, first of all, the mean might not be the only thing that you are interested in. It's entirely possible, for example, to get the means of the treated and control groups to be the exact same or very, very close, and yet the distributions still don't look quite the same, and you might be worried whether your matching has actually worked properly in that case. For example, maybe your treated and control groups after matching look something like this. Uh, both of the means are the same for these two uh, distributions. They both have a mean of zero, and so on a balance table, that would look totally fine. And yet, we would not really say that this matching worked particularly well. Right? The distribution of the matching variable is still quite different. And so looking at the distribution of an entire matching variable, or perhaps the propensity score, uh, is a pretty good idea after you've done your matching to see how well things line up. Uh, here we can see how that works for the Brookman study. Uh, we see how the uh, distribution of percentage black in the area looks after we do our matching and weighting, and that looks pretty decent, right? It doesn't line up exactly, uh, but we do see that there's quite a lot of similarity in what the distribution of percentage black looks like between the black legislators and the non-black legislators after we do our matching. Over on the right, we see the propensity score distribution uh, after we do our matching. Uh, now this we would really kind of want to be pretty close because uh, we are literally waiting based on the propensity score in order to make these two things the same. So if they don't look the same, uh, that's a little bit concerning. Uh, so here we get some similarities, uh, but we also see quite a lot of differences uh, that we see a lot more non-black legislators with really low propensity scores and also really, really high propensity scores uh, for some reason. Uh, so looking at that graph on the right, that balance there, uh, even though the average is the same, that might give me a little bit of a concern in the propensity score weighting that I have just done in this case. And I might want to go back and redo my matching in that instance. All right, so those are three things that we need to be concerned about and assumptions that we need to make, and in the latter two cases, check, uh, when we are doing matching. Uh, if we want to be able to identify a causal effect by simply matching a treated and control group, we need to make a conditional independence assumption. We need to assume that we have matched on all the variables necessary to close all the back doors that we need. Um, of course, talked about back doors in many, many videos in the first half of this series. We also talked about needing to check the common support of our treated and control groups. If we want to match on a variable or match on a propensity score, we need to make sure that there is something to match to. Uh, if there's simply nobody out there who looks like you, then we don't have a match for you. You're going to get dropped from the sample. And if we have to drop a lot of people uh, who maybe have particular characteristics that are hard to match on, well, you know, how representative are our results really? And that might, that might be something we need to be concerned about. We talked about that a little bit back with course and exact matching, where it's really hard to find a match, uh, and so it's very likely to get dropped from the sample. Same idea here, if we simply can't find a match for you, you might need to get dropped. If we drop a lot of people, we might worry about how representative our results are. Lastly, we talked about needing to check and make assumptions about balance. We need to make sure that our matching procedure actually did the thing we were trying to get it to do, which was make similar looking treatment and control groups. Uh, we can check whether the averages of our treatment and control groups are similar on the basis of the variables we've matched on using a balanced table by simply comparing the means between treatment and control. We can also look at the distribution of the variables between treatment and control. Hopefully those also look fairly similar after we've done our matching, because after all, making them look similar is exactly what our matching process was trying to do in the first place. So did it do it? If it didn't work, maybe go back and try your matching procedure again, make a couple of changes about the way you do the matching, maybe add some polynomials to, to your propensity score model. I don't know, lots of different options. Go check the chapter for more details. All right, that's it for these assumptions we need to think about. Uh, thank you very much.